By the 8th century, the form of the South Indian temple had fully evolved in Tamil Nadu. At Kanchipuram and Mamallapuram, some of the finest temples ever to be made were created under the Pallavas. Further south, under the Pandyas, at Kalugumulai, the Vattuvan Kovil temple had been hewn out of the hill face. The sculptures on the temple were carved in fine detail in a naturalistic style. The hard stone was transformed to appear as soft flesh with the breath of life within. In about 850 AD, a Chola chieftain named Vijayalaya took control of Tanjavur and ushered in an era of unsurpassed prosperity and grandeur in Tamil Nadu. The largest and most impressive temples of South India were made under the Cholas. At Narthamalai, located on top of a hill, amidst the great beauty of nature, is a 9th century temple. An inscription names it as the Vijayalaya Cholishvara Temple. It may have been made under Vijayalaya Chola or by the Muttaraya chieftains before his rule. The temple is dedicated to Shiva and faces west. Dwarapalas or guardian figures are made at the entrance to the Ardha Mandapa or hall. They stand half turned in the manner established in the Pallava period. One hand displays the gesture of vismaya, or wonder. Indeed, it is a sense of wonder which fills the art of this period. The temples are made with a jewel-like perfection. The temple itself and every sculpture on it serve to take us away from the mundane concerns to a world filled with a sense of the wonder of all of creation. A temple which marks the extraordinary quality of early Chola sculpture is the Brahma Purishvara at Pullamangai. The temples of this period were not very large. The purpose was not to inspire awe through size and grandeur. It was to take us to the world of gentleness, which can be found within us. The grace of the figures and their profoundly peaceful expressions awaken a sense of the sublime. The figures are fully occupied with the miracle of creation and the sense of stillness which comes from this absorption. Shiva's Ganas are the persons who were most devoted to the Lord. They have won the right to be perpetually close to him. The dwarves that are represented in temples are the souls of the individuals who were greatly devoted to their Lord and they have come nearer to God and they have achieved the state where they will remain always in the company of the God and they are happy um, dancing, singing and that is the reflection of the human aspiration and human soul which has reached the status of divinity. Ganas are some of the finest expressions of Chola art. In Indian art the entire range of emotions and human life is given a place. Be it glee, sorrow, 
o mischief. Ganas are seen lost in devotion to the Lord. We can relate most easily to them as they play their musical instruments or dance with elation. When beings are so enraptured, can they be at all troubled by petty material concerns? The temple presents the path towards a bliss which knows no end. On the south wall of the Ardha Mandapa, we see Ganesha, also known as Ganapati, the leader of the Ganas who are made around him. A central motive in Indian art is the human figure riding on a viala or leogriff. He is borne by the majestic power of the courage within us. Every part of the temple wall is dressed. Small yet extremely detailed reliefs adorn sections of the temple along with the larger sculptures. Mover coil, the two remaining out of three Shiva temples at Kodambalur, strike the perfect balance between a dignified majesty of the spirit and the joy contained in it. The temple is an embodiment of the divine in each of us. In the Garbha Griha, or womb chamber, we are born again in knowledge of the formless eternal. Through niches in the wall of the temple, the deity is made visible in different forms to the devotee. Through these images, the divine is given a personality which the worshipper can relate to. The deity is made human yet always filled with a luminosity which awakens the finest within us. How, how can something as material as uh, a piece of carved stone um, suggest or evoke something that in its essence is beyond materiality, um, transcends materiality, and yet the Indian sculptor, uh, sculptors at their greatest have been able, have found ways to suggest these very profound um, uh, spiritual and religious and intellectual ideas through the, 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 um, the human body and through their, uh, their sculptural uh, genius. Shiva dances on the demon of forgetfulness. In Indic belief, our ignorance is the forgetting of the truth which can so easily be found again within us. The sculptures, which are the outward manifestations of the deity within, do not teach us anything new. They raise us upwards through our response to their beauty and grace. It is believed in Indic philosophy that the aesthetic experience is akin to Brahmananda, or the final bliss of salvation itself. It is in that moment that the veils of illusion are lifted and we see the grace which is in all of creation. It is also believed that each moment of the experience of beauty leaves us just a little richer than before. Each time we are able to see the grace which is ever-present, we become more capable of perceiving it again. Till finally, we may lose ourselves completely in the divine which pervades all that there is. Another temple of the early Chola period, of the late 9th 
or the beginning of the 10th century is the Kuranganatha Temple at Srinivasanalur. The Chola temples of this time have some of the finest sculpture ever made in India. A benign and peaceful Shiva as Dakshinamurti is met on the south of the Tal. It is a view of the world the artist shares with us, which is filled with the harmony of the natural order. There is none of the turmoil and ceaseless confusion created by our egos and material desires. As the devotee goes around the temple, he perceives the world in its deep essence of beauty and quietude. Across more than a millennium, the artists strike chords which resonate within us and transport us to a gentle realm where Shiva has placed his foot firmly on the demon of forgetfulness. All the creatures of the world, big and small, are filled with the same divinity. Can there be a better aim than to lose oneself in the adoration of divinity? In the appreciation of the glory around us? As with other early Chola temples, the Kuranganatha strikes a fine balance. Size and grandeur do not overwhelm the intimate feeling of the temple and its sculpture. The attendant figures appear to step out of their niches to share the treasure of their beauty and grace with us. It is a peace which can fill us so much that there would be no space for the feeling of any worldly pain. The second half of the 10th century is called the Sembian Mahadevi period of Chola art. She was the queen of Gandharaditya Chola who died early. Sembian Mahadevi went on to become a great patron of art and her influence was predominant till the early part of the reign of Raja Raja Chola at the end of the 10th century. The temples of her time were still made on a modest scale and the emphasis is on a very personal devotion to the divine. The temples have been renovated in later times, obscuring much of the original art. However, what survives is exquisite. It was in this time that the characteristic image of Shiva performing the Ananda Tandava dance was established. The beauty of this form of Shiva in the dance of cosmic bliss was found deeply moving. A contemporaneous Tamil saint Appar writes many moving verses in praise of this form of Shiva. In the beginning of the 11th century, we see a dramatic change of emphasis and scale in temple building. The art of ancient India had been patronized by the people. The sculptures and stupa railings of early times were sponsored by fishermen, farmers, shopkeepers, housewives, monks and nuns. The themes were the eternal ones and ephemeral personalities were not usually depicted in ancient Indian art. By the 8th century, kings had begun to directly patronize temples and their art. Under the Pallavas, portraits of kings had begun to appear.
In the year 1010, Raja Raja Chola completed the tallest and largest temple which had been made in India. The Brihadishvara, dedicated to the great Lord Shiva, was made to express his own power and military might as much as the grandeur of the Lord. The temple is five times the size of previous Chola ones and its Vimana or tower stands 216 feet tall. Its monolithic stupi or crowning element weighs 80 tons and it is believed that an earthen ramp six kilometers long was made to take it up to its position. Raja Raja had greatly expanded his empire in all directions, including to the island of Sri Lanka. The temple was made to celebrate his achievements. Raja Raja gave generous endowments of land and finances to run the large administration of the temple. We see here the beginnings of the temple as a great center of the cultural activities of the community. 400 dancers were brought from 91 temples all over the empire to dance in the temple complex. Great entrance goparams were made. These paved the way for the later development of entrance gateways as the predominant architectural feature of Tamil temples. The Dwarapalas made here lack the sense of spontaneous movement seen in earlier Chola and Pallava art. There are two levels of niches made around the Vimana. The lower tier mainly contains representations of Shiva including several dancing icons. The upper tier presents many images of Shiva as Tripurantaka, the form in which he destroys the forts of three demons with a single arrow. This image may have been favoured by Rajaraja as a symbol of his military might. The figures are less naturalistic in their poses and expressions. The projection of grandeur and the scale of the temple appear to have overtaken the personal feeling and the importance of sculpture. On the walls of a dark ambulatory around the sanctum are made the only large surviving body of Hindu murals of this period. In their vast scale and in their themes, they express the grandeur of the Lord. Raja Raja's son, Rajendra I, extended the Chola Empire even further. He also made the first victorious campaign of a southern ruler into North India. Holy water was brought back from the river Ganga and a new capital was founded near Tanjavur. It was named Gangai Konda Cholapuram, the city of the Chola who had captured the Ganga. He followed the example set by his father and made a temple on a vast scale in his new capital. This was also dedicated to Brihadishvara, the great Lord Shiva. It is, however, not as tall as the earlier temple. The Vimana has an unusual concave shape. Numerous niches made around the Vimana house a large number of iconic sculptures. Among the finest is of Shiva conferring grace on Chandesha, a great devotee of the Lord. 
It has been suggested that this depiction has a double meaning, relating to Shiva's blessings to Rajendra I. The grand scale of later Chola temples is also seen in the Erateshwara temple at Dharasuram, made by King Raja Raja Chola II in the 12th century. It is a magnificent structure which brings alive a period of regal splendor. By the 13th century, the power of the Cholas declined. Memories linger still of the four centuries of their rule. This was a flourishing time of a great and sophisticated culture in Tamil Nadu. The finest temples were made. Sculpture was created which took the devotee to the deepest realms of the peace to be found within. Ambalam tanil adipani bavarka bajaya milaya ananda natamadu vartilai.